<laughs> it's a trick. I was trying to trick you, George. Yeah, nice to see you, Louis. Welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, Welcome. nice to be here. Bonjour. Nice to see everybody. Um, and thank you, Louis, and thank you, Geraldine, for having me here today. Uh, much appreciated. I got a, when I got the call from Louis that he wanted me to come speak, I thought to myself, well, I want to go to Paris with some great words of wisdom. But I had some second thoughts about wisdom because I was sitting at my summer home on Sunday writing my thoughts of wisdom. But my nephew, who's nine years old, was sitting next to me and he was writing a report for school. And it's a biography of Socrates. And I brought it to read to you this morning. It's short. Socrates was a great man. He helped people and he taught people. He gave great speeches full of honesty and wisdom. Socrates always told people the truth and he made them face up to their toughest, most difficult problems. They killed him. So, <laughs> what I want to talk about this morning is what uh, I call three social thunderstorms. I've been in the tech industry for many years and uh, I've come to realize that tech change does not happen gradually, it happens unexpectedly, like a thunderstorm. The first change I want to talk about is the death of the web. And I know it's right before lunch. We all want a very nice French lunch. We want to have our red wine. But I'm going to talk about technology, basic technology, for a few moments. And on this graphic, on the bottom, is time moving to the right. And on the y-axis is utilities per dollar, what you get per dollar or per, year, per euro. And I'm going to look at the basic technologies of storage, processor, and network. Let's start first with processor. We all know this. This is uh, Moore's Law, a doubling of processing power approximately every 18 months. And according to my friends in the fab business, that will persist for the next eight to 10 years. So doubling of processing power every 18 months. There's a curve actually above processor, which is storage. And I call this Hitachi's Law, Hitachi being a dominant maker of storage, uh, doubling of storage every 12 months approximately. So processor becoming very powerful, storage becoming uh, storage everywhere and uh, very, very cheap. There's actually a curve below these two curves, which is the network. So yes, the network is improving in power, but not at the same speed as processor and storage. In fact, if you look at Europe, Today, uh, 4G users, about 12% of the population, and uh, 3G users, about 60%. So it will actually take years before 4G begins to penetrate even above 50% of the population. So what this tells you is that if you were to build an architecture based only around the network, in other words, having to move all your bits through the network, you would be wasting over time all of this extraordinary improvement in processing power and storage. So what does that mean? If you think about those trends over the long term, it means that the center is becoming ever more powerful. Those are the Google, those big Google data centers. If you go over to Total, that's their data center being driven by those processor and storage curves. But it also means that the periphery of the network is becoming ever more powerful as well. And I put my iPad someplace, here it is. So there's, there's a, a few computer scientists at IEEE who benchmark supercomputers. And they recently benchmarked the iPad 2. And they made a statement that the iPad 2 is equivalent to a 1986 Cray 2 six processor supercomputer. I don't know if you all remember that. Many of you are very young, but it was round. It had a bench around it. And it was the preeminent computer in the world, highest speed. In 1993, that's not long ago, 
that's less than 20 years ago, the iPad 2 would have been considered one of the 30 fastest computers in the world. It's running at 1.65 gigaflops, it's billions of floating point instructions per second. So my question to you is this, considering the power of this device, what will we, what will we hold in our hands five years from now? The periphery of this network is becoming ever more intelligent. So what this tells us is that several of the old architectures are now dead. The first model is, of course, the PC model, which said put all of your executables on the desktop. But the problem with that model is it doesn't leverage the cloud. So that is a dead model. The second model says, oh yeah, put everything in the web, put everything in the cloud. And the problem with that direction is that you have to run it through that network, which is improving, but not at the same rate as processor and storage. But it's not taking advantage of this extraordinary growth in power at the periphery. So we think the web, which as you know, 95% of web executable is at the server, not at your powerful PC. And cloud, of course, is in the central data center. So we think that that is also an outmoded model. So what emerges? We see a model emerging that we call App Internet. It says that we'll have very powerful services in the cloud, data, services, etc., connected to and interpolating with very powerful applications on these local devices. And by the way, when I say local device, I don't just mean an iPad or, port or, or mobile. It also means PCs. It also ultimately will mean servers with a connection between the two, a transparent interpolation between the application and those services. And what we have today on, on, a, on an Android is a very simple version of this. And um, this trend is being driven not just by technology. So I was with the, uh, the CEO of Gilt recently. Gilt is a US company. It's uh, sort of like, uh, I think it's a vente privé is the French company equivalent. And I was with the CEO and I said, how do your, what do your customers prefer in experience to use Gilt? This is an online, uh, you probably all know Gilt, but it's uh, online uh, sales of luxury uh, goods. And she said, it's very interesting. As time is going on, we're finding that our customers are now migrating away from the web, and they want to use Gilt primarily through applications. Faster, simpler, more immersive, a better experience, and experience is a very important word. In fact, we're hearing this at Forrester from many retail companies who are saying, we have a much better chance to transfer the experience of our store through the application experience rather than from the web experience. In fact, Forrester believes that the app internet, this architecture, is, a, will be, well, is today a $2.2 billion market growing at approximately 85%. It's going to be a very, very large market. And in fact, we surveyed very large corporations in the US and Europe, the decision makers in software, in, who are making, the, the decision makers making decisions about software, and 41% said that they're now migrating some of their development away from the web and toward applications. So this is the architecture that we believe will become dominant in the future. Remember, the web is not the internet. Often people confuse the two. The web is a software architecture that we all decided to put on the internet 20 years ago. But it is just as the web uh, came after other software which preceded it, the web will also eventually be replaced. App internet, we think, is the best direction uh, for that replacement. Now, this is a, a chart that I could spend an hour on, but I, my time is limited. This is what we call the Forrester wave. This is the typical graphic that Forrester uses to grade vendors. On the, uh, on the x-axis is strategy, weak and strong, and on the y-axis is product, weak and strong. And what I want to do now is put all the vendors on this graphic. So upper right-hand quadrant is where you want to be. That's the great place. And I'm going to give you a little warning that before I put the vendors up, it looks a little bit like those movies from the Depression, 
where there's a guy in a restaurant and he's eating a big steak. He's having a wonderful meal. And there's a window, and on the window, all these little children have their faces pressed up against the window, looking at the guy eating his wonderful meal. Starving children. So it looks a little bit like that. Upper right-hand quadrant, Apple. Um, I think that we would like to imagine that Steve Jobs and Apple were always brilliant, and I think obviously they were very smart, but a lot of luck played into them being in the upper right-hand quadrant. Remember, Steve Jobs never envisioned that others would write apps for the iPhone or the iPad. He was talked into that later. But there's Apple. Now I'm going to put all, the, all of the uh, traditional vendors up here. Uh, Salesforce, IBM, looking probably better positioned than many of the other players. And then the third group are what I would call the web huggers. The companies who are very focused on the web, Google, Facebook, and some of these foreign companies like Renren, very HTML focused. Remember, Google, if they could, would stop the world from turning. They love the web. Every time you click on the web, they have a chance to make money. They do not want the web to end. In fact, that looking at Google here, I think that they're coming up on what I would call a Lenin Trotsky moment at, at Google because you have much of Google still focused on the web, but as Marissa just said, we also have some of Google now focused toward Android. I have Google down at, at this lower point, even though they're in the Android business, because only about three to 4% of their, of, their, of their revenue comes from Android today. And then, I know all, many of you in this room are focused on opportunities. There are some very cool opportunities in App Internet. Software entrance, as I said, a $2.2 billion market, now growing 85%. Uh, platform entrance, and also services serving the app internet business. Now, it's kind of cool because uh, if you think back into the technology industry, every 10 years, there's a vendor who we think is dead who comes back. So in 1980, that would be Intel. In the year 1990, IBM. In the year 2000, Apple. So here, now we are in 2010. Which of these vendors, in the lower left, could in fact revive themselves? And we could have a big debate about this. We could have a wonderful uh, discussion about this. I'm sure everyone has an opinion. If you look at the app internet architecture, it looks a lot like gaming. You can't play Call of Duty over HTML or over the web. You can't do it. You have a very powerful device, Xbox, PS3, very powerful, sharing with resources with the cloud. So I think, and by the way, I'm not predicting this, but I think it's, a, it's probably a, the first bid that perhaps Microsoft is the possibility to become that player who turns around in 2010. I would say they, have, they probably have, need a generational change in leadership there for that to happen. So there are three companies emerging in what I would call the app internet ecosystems. Uh, number one is uh, Apple, we talked about that. Um, I think that Apple could have a problem uh, in, its, in building its ecosystem because it, it is overcharging. I think it's, what is 30% that they're charging and many companies like uh, Financial Times are saying too much money. So Apple, this could be a problem. But Apple, definitely one of the ecosystems. Second ecosystem, of course, is Google um, around Android. And then the third ecosystem, I think a dark horse, but very interesting candidate, is Amazon. If you, if you look carefully at Amazon Silk, that is a very cool step away from the web and toward app internet. That new, I don't know what we call it, an operating system or a super browser, but it is an app internet move. It was interesting, last night at the, uh, Louis had a great reception at the Elysee Palace. And I met a, uh, an entrepreneur, maybe is in this room, who has a cool app. And as it turned out, Amazon has an exclusive for that app to appear only on the Amazon Fire and only in Silk for six months. So you can see, Amazon is trying very early on here to build its own ecosystem. I think the third player who could end up in, as part of this ecosystem is Microsoft. Depending on the qualities of Windows 8, 
uh, how they use Xbox. We kind of heard that this morning from uh, the executive from Microsoft. But those are the three early ecosystems in this business. All right, I know that was a, a big first thunderstorm. Uh, let's go on to thunderstorm two, and that is social saturation. And this is the, of course, Forrester, we do research all over the world with consumers. We survey about a million consumers a year in about 85% of the world's GDP. And what we're finding is that social is running out of hours. In other words, people are using social many hours, so we're running out of hours. We're all, social's also running out of people. I'll explain that. Let's look at hours first. Now, this is US only, so excuse me, but that's where uh, this comes from the Labor Department of the US government. In the US now, online consumers are using social more than they are volunteering, more than they are praying, observing religious, uh, being, being in church, more than they are on the phone, emailing, and using snail mail, and then finally, more than they are exercising. And in fact, we're using social just a little bit less now than shopping, and a little bit less than childcare. So we believe that social is running out of hours. That's a, we feel, Forrester believes, according to our research, we're sort of reaching the limits of hours that users can give to social. So that's one. But social is also running out of people. So this is social adoption in the US and Europe. Uh, I'll go fast here. So at the end of 2011, this is online consumers. 80% of the online consumers in Europe are social. In the US, it is 86%. So very high penetration now of social. And now I'm going to do this by country. Here are the European countries. And you can see uh, all the way up to Poland uh, in the mid-90s. So Europe, very penetrated. Now look at Asia, a little less penetrated, but moving between 70 and 90s. US and Canada, uh, 80 in the high 80s. And then the emerging world, and I, I have, excuse me for this, but these are, this is data only on urban centers. We have not surveyed the western part of, of China as an example, but for urban centers uh, in the BRIC countries, extremely high penetration of social in the, high, in the mid to high 90s. So social is running out of hours, and social is running out of people. So what does this mean? Number one, yes, we're in a bubble. If you are building social platforms, which will require more time of more users, you will likely not be successful. And we believe that this is going to sweep away some of the nonsense like Foursquare and some of these time-wasting social applications. And we're going to move to a post-social world. I had to make up an acronym there, so POSO a post-social world, which is a little bit like web in the year 2000. It's kind of a, it's kind of a pets.com uh, place that we're at, where there was a lot of launched, a lot of companies launched, but in the post-bubble period, post-2000, they did not survive. We believe that the next wave of social will be social applications which are more efficient, faster, easier to use, and have a higher value per time equation. So we are not, the, the, the time wasting mode no longer available to social. We, the, there will be a new wave in the post social period of new players, more efficient and more time saving. And finally, as I said, the post social players will dominate. So let's go on to thunder, Thunderstorm 3, my shortest one, because I am running out of time. And this is enterprise. So I'm not going to bore you with this graphic, but I'll just boil it down for you. 72% of large corporations are either implementing social internally or they're very interested. So very fast velocity we see in enterprise. Why are they doing this? Better customer interaction, customer self-service. That's very interesting. Please note that, that, uh, that enterprise social is really about customers, how customers will be better served, and then the final one is internal and external collaboration. But customer is the primary focus for enterprise social. And what does this mean? It means that beyond SharePoint, there are massive opportunities in 
enterprise. Now the question is, people ask me, well, George, you know, if it's not SharePoint, what's it going to be? And um, I think that, by the way, I think this is very immature. So uh, these are some possibilities. But Salesforce with Chatter, kind of a cool possibility. Uh, IBM, a possibility. SharePoint improved drastically, because SharePoint is not a well-liked product in large companies. But SharePoint improved drastically under Windows 8, a possibility. But I actually think we're going to see new players here beyond SharePoint, not just those old, the old IBMs and the old Salesforce. Possible, but new players. Massive opportunity here. Uh, I'm almost finished the week, I promise. Uh, a rich professional services opportunity. Uh, the ad firms cannot be dependent, on, dependent to do this well in large companies. So we, uh, we are going to see an opportunity for many of you to do professional services. And the last point is a major test of marketing and B BT is business technology. That's beyond IT and BT collaboration. I was at L'Oreal on a Tuesday with the CIO and the CMO, and they're making great progress working together around social within L'Oreal. So it's a, it's a note to all of you, if you go into this business, if you go in enterprise, you're going to have to work with the CIO and the CMO. Always difficult. So what are the, what are the I'm almost finished. When the sky's clear, a new social platform, App Internet. Two, a new era in social, which we think is, we, we call post-social, more efficient, faster, higher value per time equation. A new, new social opportunities, open your eyes to enterprise, massive opportunity here. And finally, yes, social will thrive, but in an evolved form. I hope that helps. Thank you very much. That do, does help. Thank you very much. George, really, really happy you came here. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you much. so much. Nice to see you. Thank yeah. you.